It had been a slow day. I was sitting at my desk going through my little black book. Edna Carlyle, Warden Road, Bellevue Hill. Beautiful girl, Edna. Auburn hair, green, gray eyes. And I put a cross through her name. She married a grazier a few days before. Wilma Marshall. Now, there was a dame. <laughs> the Terrigal was a little too far to travel. Sally Bishop. Uh-huh. Blonde with brown eyes, a beauty mark on her cheek. Not too many brains, but who wants an intellectual conversation when it's cold outside? I reach for the phone. Uh, it happens every time. It's like lighting a cigarette when you're fishing. Larry Kent, private investigations. Mr. Kent, this is, uh, this is an admirer of yours. Well, if you're trying to sell me something... Oh, no. In fact, I have a very interesting case for you. Well, couldn't you come to my office? I'm sorry, no. What's your name? <laughs> sorry, I can't tell you that either. Well, what can you tell me? This. How would you like to earn 500 pounds? What do I have to do? Find a murderer. Who's he killed? Well, the murder hasn't taken place yet. Look, Buster, I've had eight hilarious gags pulled on me during the past week. I'm getting a little tired of it. So go and tell the character who put you onto this that he can... Oh, hold on, please, Mr. Kent. I don't blame you for being dubious. But you'll see very soon that I'm serious. If you'll just hear me out. Well, make it fast. A person will be murdered soon with a 28 caliber bullet. 28 caliber? Yes. There is only one gun made for that size bullet. It's an Italian pistol, the Marcinetti. So when you discover that a murder has been committed with a 28 caliber bullet, you know I'm not joking. Yeah, you're a real card. Please go on. The 500 pounds will be yours when and if you solve the murder. Here are some clues. Even if you knew my name, you would not find it in the telephone directory, though I'm using my own phone. Second clue, I'm not as I sound. Good day, Mr. Kent. Character. I figured it was a drunk with a queer sense of humor or a gag pulled by my actor or newspaper friends. I forgot about it. But next morning, I saw the two articles had been pushed beneath my apartment door. One was an envelope. A stack of ten-pound notes and a typewritten message that went, This is to show I am not joking. One hundred pounds to cover expenses. 500 more when and if you name the murderer. Your admirer. I had a good look at the tenors. They were real. Then I unfolded the newspaper. The headline had been circled with a heavy black pencil. It went, S.P. Bookmaker Murdered. There wasn't much to the story. The S.P. man was George Dunn. He'd been shot during the night. There was no mention of the caliber bullet. Inspector Walter Dermott was in charge of inquiries, so a trip to headquarters. Larry Kent. Oh, no. What do you want? Dermott was his usual sweet self. I said, what do you want? Just a little courtesy. Oh. Would you recognize it if you got it from a cop? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, smart. Look... Inspector, why don't we get along, huh? Well, we could, Kent, you know. Uh, if you got yourself a plane ticket to the States, I'd be right there at Mascot. Yeah, to uh, make sure that I went. Yeah. Now, what do you want? Make it quick. What's going on uh, on this bookmaker case? I am now giving an imitation of the Sphinx. Why do you want to know, Kent? Mm, murders always interest me. I know one that would delight me. <clears throat> you think you'll get the killer? We usually do. Well, you shouldn't have much trouble finding this one. Uh, what makes you say that? Well, it's not everybody who owns a 28 caliber pistol. Uh, tw uh, tw 
Who told you it was a 28, Kent? I'll have him directing traffic on Market Street. I'll break... Thanks, it. Inspector. Well, there it was. Just like my screwball friend had told me over the phone. I went to the office, thought about the so-called clues he'd given me. Neither was worth a darn. Larry Kent, private investigation. Good day, Mr. Kent. You recognize my voice, don't you? Yeah. Using a payphone now, huh? Yes. Not very far from your office. Well, are you satisfied that I wasn't joking? Yeah. But uh, tell me something. Gladly. Did you kill George Dunn? <laughs> what do you think? Well, I figure you must have. After all, you gave me the advance information. You could be very, very wrong. Here's another clue. Watch out for a dark woman. I assume you're going to follow the case. Yeah. Good. By the way, thanks for the hundred pounds. <laughs> Not at all. Will I be hearing from you again? Never know. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Kent. I did some checking all that day. Here's what I found out. The dead guy had no relatives, no close male friends who could tell me anything about him, but there were rumors that he'd cleaned up a fortune as an SP man. George Dunn had been in his 50s, fat and bald. One piece of information was that he'd been friendly with a pretty brunette, which made me think of my screwball friend's third clue. Watch out for a dark woman. I got Dunn's address, waited till after the funeral, then I went to his apartment in Rose Bay, armed with skeleton keys. But just for the heck of it, I pressed the door buzzer. I heard soft steps inside the apartment, and then... Yes? The dame in the doorway was curvaceous, pretty and a very dark brunette. What is it? I didn't expect to find anybody here. Uh, this apartment was George Dunn's, wasn't it? I'm Carla Dunn, his cousin. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, can I have a talk with you? Who are you and what do you want? My name's Larry Kent. I'm a private investigator. I've been hired to look into your uh, cousin's murder. Who hired you? Well, I'm not supposed to give away information like that. You see, I'm a very private investigator. Are you going to let me come in? Why not? I have nothing to hide. Thanks. I'm afraid there's not much I can tell you that'll help, Mr. Kent. Well, I think there is. First off, you can tell me why you call yourself his cousin. Because I thought it would save a lot of unnecessary explaining. Hmm. You surprise me. It was a nice, quick answer. What are you doing here in the apartment? If you'll come into the living room, I'll tell you. Okay. You see, I was in Melbourne when I heard... Don't try anything. Keep him covered, Roger. Well, well. Walked right into him. My, what a mess you've made of the living room. Looking for something? Roger, this is Larry Kent, a private detective. Charmed. Just don't make any kind of move, that's all. Roger was tall and slim. He had a good tailor. His hair was black and wavy. His face was narrow. The skin as smooth and hairless as a baby's. His eyes were big and clear. He was, all in all, a very cute boy. But he was shaking a little, and he didn't seem at home with a gun in his hand. You'll now tell us why you've come here, Mr. Kent. Well, I figured I might find something that would help me with my investigation. And how did you expect to get in? Skeleton keys. So you were George Dunn's girlfriend, huh? And now you and uh, Pretty Boy here are looking for George's dough. He, he knows too much, Carla. He was just guessing. I see it was a pretty good guess. What are we going to do with him? You could use that gun, Roger. And why don't you, Pretty Boy? Maybe I will. I don't think so. You know what I really think? I figure that if I turn my back and walk out of here, you two will let me go. Don't be too sure of that. You wouldn't kill me. The shot would be heard. Murder's a tough rap. Stay right there. So long. All right. Roger, don't. I walked out of there. On the sidewalk, I wiped my forehead. 
Roger had been holding a 32. George Dunn had been killed with a 28 from a Mancinetti pistol. I had a pretty clear picture with some pieces left out of what was going on. Carter had been playing games with George Dunn, but had been holding on to Roger on the side. Carla had told Roger not to shoot. Why? Well, there were two answers. One, she didn't want murder, which suggested that she hadn't knocked off Dunn. Two, she wanted to learn more about me. So I was expecting a visit. And I was right. It was 10.15 p.m. in my apartment. Hello. Hi. Alone? Mm-hmm. Come in. Thank you. Want me to take your coat? Please. Hmm. When I'd met Carla at Dunn's apartment, she had said she had nothing to hide. <laughs> How wrong she was. Her skin was tan. Her dress was white. Slim waist. Long legs. Curves and slopes. Uh, a lovely package of tan and white, with tan predominating. Wondering why I'm here? Well, maybe I'll start wondering in a minute, but uh, right now the view has my attention. I was hoping you'd approve of me. Why? It makes it so much easier for us to do business. Business? Yes. I'm listening. Who hired you to investigate George's murder? Why? Well, it's important that I know. Uh, is it going to do me any good if I tell you? Well, it's going to do you a lot of harm if you don't. She moved fast. Her purse opened. Her right hand pulled a gun out. There was a silencer at the end of it. This time, Mr. Kent, I won't be afraid of attracting attention. I thought you were a little on my side, Carla. And what made you think that? Well, you told Roger not to shoot me. Only because his gun wasn't equipped with a silencer. This one is. Ah, uh, yes, but you're not the murdering type. There's so much in this that even murder is worthwhile. Why go that far when you don't have to? Well, I don't want to. But if I must... Put the gun away. In the first place, it doesn't scare me. In the second place, there are better ways to do business. For instance? Well, this. Oh, 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 my wrist. And I'll, oh. I'll bend for the gun, honey, or I'll give you a real hard spanking. Oh, my wrist. I'll kiss it for you. Oh, you. Uh-uh, no nasty words. I'll take the gun. Uh, that's a nice little toy. But uh, look, you have the safety catch on. All right. So I didn't mean to use the gun. If you look further, you'll see it isn't even loaded. Hey, it isn't. You took an awful chance, you know. I didn't think you'd shoot it out with a lady. Yeah, but there was a chance I might have figured you weren't a lady. How much dough is in this, Carla? Plenty. Enough for me to get a cut? Keep talking. Well, I've got some information that, added to information you might have could prove to be important. All right. What is it? Uh, <laughs> I'm in the driver's seat. I wonder how much you do know. Well, you'll find out by answering some questions about George Dunn's past. You could be after the money, too. How do I know I can trust you? Oh, look how far apart my eyes are. You didn't go to the apartment just for the fun of it. I told you I was looking for clues that had helped me find Dunn's murderer. And your client? Now, that's private for the time being. You talk, I talk. I'm not sure I can trust you. Well, how about me? For instance, there's Roger. Where does he come into it? Roger means nothing. He was ready to protect you with a gun. I doubt if he'd have fired. But you told him not to fire. That was just insurance. He was shaking so much, it was possible he would have pulled the trigger. He's crazy about you, isn't he? Yes, he is. Yeah, 
I don't blame him. But it's not a two-way affair. Oh. Yeah, he was just a change from George Dunn, is that it? It's a crude way of putting it, but yes. You're a very naughty girl, Carla. Well, a girl has to look after herself. Roger's a handsome man, dances well, and in some ways he's fun. George was fat and ugly. But he had dough. As I said, a girl has to look after herself. And a girl could do a lot worse than you. Well, <laughs> it won't work, honey. We could make it work, Mary. Roger's not my type. I was just marking time with him, using him. And you'd be willing to dump him? Yes. You know what I mean, don't you? You and me, huh? Yeah. We could get along. I assure you. That was a very satisfactory sample, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah. Then let's go into it together. Tell me what you were doing in this thing, and then I'll tell you all I know. Uh-uh. Put it around the other way. But oh, I'm not sure of you. And vice versa. You could take my information and then spill a, uh, spin a tall yarn. So, you first, huh? I'll have to think about it. Okay. Go to it. Not here. I'll meet you at the Angel Club. Say, 1 a.m. I want to walk around and think it out. Okay, Carla. 1 a.m. at the Angel Club. I'll be there. I was there at 10 minutes to 1. The Angel Club is small and pricey. The clientele is a mixed lot. But the guys who go there have one thing in common. They've got dough. The dames have one thing in common, too. Each has a lot of curves and an angle. The head waiter took my two notes, led me to a table just big enough for a lamp, a bottle of scotch, and a glass. I sat there for quite a while. Then after one, still no Carla. <laughs> and she'd been putting on an act just to get out of my apartment. Hello. She was a blonde and she was dressed for a kill. Ice cream complexion, blue eyes, a silhouette, like an elegant bass fiddle. You're Larry Kent, aren't you? That's right. Carla gave a good description of you. She wasn't exaggerating either. Carla? Who's Carla? <laughs> Careful sort of fellow, aren't you? Just as well, I suppose. Carla sent me here to get you. Why didn't she come herself? It's up to her to tell you that. My job is to take you to her. Where is she? Epping. Do you have a car? Yeah. Then let's go, shall we? We went. The blonde's name was Sylvia. She sat very close all the way to Epping. It's the house on the corner. Right. You know, I'm sorry we're here. You should have driven slower. You should have given me a cue. Next time, maybe. Unless Carla has ideas of a monopoly. We got out. Walked across the street. It was a big house, two-story. A few lights were burning on the ground floor. Carla's not here yet. Her car isn't on the driveway, which means uh, we can have a drink together. That'll be cozy. I've got the key in my purse. Um, here it is. I'll take it. <laughs> on top of everything else, you're a gentleman. After you. Thank you. She brushed past me. I followed her in. Scotch? Yeah. Twice in the same glass. Coming up. I lit a cigarette. It 
was a big, expensively furnished room with five doors leading off. I sat on the arm of a chair and looked at Sylvia as she finished making the drinks. She came back, <laughs> negotiating the distance with a sort of slow samba. Here we are. Here's to... You make the toast, honey. Okay. Here's to, uh... The knockout drops you slipped into this scotch. You can have it, sweetheart. Stop. And I'll have you. Let me go. As the door in front of us opened, I pulled Sylvia to me with my left hand and held onto a tight. In my other hand was my 38. The guy in the doorway held a thin barrel gun. A 28 caliber Mancinetti. It appears I'm late. Yeah. You shoot and you hit her. Let me... Oh! Yeah, the harder you kick, honey, the tighter I squeeze. Louie, don't shoot! Please, Louie! You needn't worry, my dear. I won't. Oh, well, Mr. Kent, I underestimated you. You mean you overestimated yourself? Drop the gun. I think not. If you don't, I'll let you have it. You wouldn't want to have to shoot Sylvia, would you? <sighs> You've appealed to my better nature. Okay, sweetheart. Sit down and keep your mouth shut. Oh, why, you dirty... Do as he says, Sylvia. Mr. Kent and I wish to talk. I'll say we do. You're the guy who sent me the hundred pounds, aren't you? But I don't sound like him, do I? <laughs> really, how stupid of me. Yes, I heard your services, Mr. Kent. Uh, listen as my voice changes. <clears throat> I hired your services in the most unorthodox manner, Mr. Kent. <laughs> Rather a good trick, isn't it? You see, I was once an actor. Louis Lang is my name. Where's Carla? Ah, the most interesting story, that. You see, I um, encountered Carla as she left your flat earlier this evening. Mm -hmm. I rented a furnished flat directly across from you, by the way, so that I could uh, watch you. I took Carla into my flat, at gunpoint, I must add. You would uh, never guess who was also in my flat. I'll buy it. The very handsome boy, Roger. <laughs> uh, uh, you never know, do you? How come he was there? Well, it's very simple. He followed Carla to your place. He then stood near your door and heard enough to make him very, very angry. I stopped him outside, at gunpoint. But after a talk, I put the gun away. You see, Roger and I decided to do business together. Very quickly, we learned from Carla that you were to meet her at the Angel Club. I sent Sylvia in her place. Roger was so angry. <laughs> it's strange what faulty love will do to a man. Poor Carla. He killed her? Yes. Well, can you guess the rest, Mr. Kent? I can guess this much. You've got George Dunn's dough. You killed him. Yes. But you don't know anything else, do you? <laughs> Very well, I'll clear it up for you. George Dunn was my client. I'm a solicitor, by the way. You know how solicitors learn things about their clients, don't you? Well, I learned he had a fortune in cash. I intended to get it and leave the country. But then, income tax trouble. The authorities said it would take four or five days to clear me. That was most upsetting. You see, Carla and George were uh, rather close, and I, I wanted to do the job while she was in Melbourne. However, she was coming back the next day, and there was a chance that she would guess. I took the money and did away with George. So I gave her you. And now you're stuck with me. You're forgetting something, aren't you, Mr. Kent? There was a smile on his thin lips, a triumphant smile. There was also a flicker of his eyes, a flicker that made me turn, throw myself to the side. A bullet sang over my head. Roger stood near a door, smoking gun in his hand. He wasn't a pretty boy anymore. His face was an ugly mask of hate. I put a bullet right through the mask. Louis! I rolled. Louis Lang was on his hands and knees, reaching for the pistol. Quick, Louis! He wasn't nearly quick enough, Sylvia. The 
next day, Sylvia was behind bars. Carla, Roger, and Lang were in the morgue. And I was in my office, looking through my little black book. A tough case always makes me think of a warm, cuddly, good-natured dame. <laughs> Come to think of it, so does everything else. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>